Welcome in to Outkick the Show. I am your fearless leader, Clay Travis. I hope wherever you may be across the country or inside the world that you are having a fantastic Tuesday afternoon and that you are ready to dive into the wild, the wacky, the wonderful, and the always entertaining Outkick the Show world. Uh, I want to tell you right off the jump, if you're going to be gambling tonight on the NBA, if you're going to be gambling on the NHL, whenever they actually announce what the second round of the series is going to look like and when the games are actually going to start, um, I would encourage you to go to sportsbookreview.com. Make sure you get the best possible numbers there. You can also gamble on the NFL uh, draft uh, and where players are going to go, who's going to be drafted first, second, third, all those different things. Uh, I love all of you. And... We're also going to dive into a lot of different stories today. I want to tell you. I'm going to tell you who my top five NFL quarterbacks are. Talked about it some this morning on the radio show. We'll rehash if you haven't heard or if you haven't heard, then we will break it down for you there. Uh, Westbrook versus Durant. I think this is a fascinating, uh, interesting story about sports that also moves beyond sports. Uh, Mitt Romney and his Jazz uh, jersey. If you didn't see Mitt Romney at the Jazz game telling what Russell Westbrook he had four fouls, Mitt Romney sitting courtside in his Jazz jersey. What is Mitt going to do as he prepares for his Senate run from the state of Utah? And Kanye West has gone public and said, I love Trump. Really, direct quote, what is Kanye West up to? Is he just trying to draw attention or is there something else going on here? that could be more intriguing, I will discuss and explain. Uh, But first, I want to tell you, go get hooked up right now. Go to my friend Ryan Kelly's website, thehomeloanexpert.com right now and get hooked up in a hurry with the best mortgage you could possibly get. End of April, I'll let you come out to the Outkick the Weekend in Vegas and we will be well on our way to having a spectacular time. Again, go to thehomeloanexpert.com you'll be glad that you did you my friends will get hooked up and you can get to come out to Vegas and get a free weekend in the hotel it's going to be fun much to get to so let's start with uh, my NFL quarterback top 5 lots of talk about how to break down the quarterbacks where they're going to go I'm going to go with you in reverse order All right, are you ready? I'm going to go with you in reverse order 5 to 1 and I think a lot of you are going to sit back and you're going to disagree uh, but I am going to share with you who I believe should be the number one overall pick and why. All right, let's start here. In the fifth spot, I have zero faith. These are the top five consensus quarterbacks. So Mason Rudolph, your guys out there who are Riley Ferguson team, you aren't in my top five. I'm breaking down the top five consensus quarterbacks. And in the five spot, I have zero faith at all in Lamar Jackson. I'm a big believer that you look at a quarterback and you try to project both a ceiling and a floor for him and I see absolutely nothing about Lamar Jackson that makes me believe that he is going to be successful. Let me explain why. One, he has an incredibly low Wonderlick score. Barely literate Wonderlick score for Lamar Jackson. Two, He has played for Bobby Petrino and typically was doing a look to see if one receiver is open and then run the football. I don't think that works. Three, I think if you are going to actually break this down in a larger context, when you think about what Lamar Jackson did, when he actually played against really talented playmakers, he was never able to make big-time plays against the big-time defenses. He got exposed when he actually went up against defenses that had great speed and the ability to contain him within the pocket. Primarily the SEC. Look at his final game with Mississippi State. Uh, Also, with, uh, with Lamar Jackson, who does he project to that looks actually good? Uh, this, this is where I think you get into an interesting question. And I can't point to any small, and remember, Lamar Jackson is not a physically tough quarterback. He's not physically overwhelming in terms of his size. To me, he's a smaller, less accurate, not as fast, because we don't know his 40 time, Marcus Mariota. What would make you believe that he's going to be better than Marcus Mariota based on every statistical measure? He's not as accurate. He doesn't throw as pretty of a ball. He doesn't have the speed necessarily of Marcus Mariota. He certainly doesn't have the height 
And we've seen what Mariota has had to deal with when he gets injured. He's not Russell Wilson. He isn't doesn't have a powerful arm and he's not extremely accurate. I can't think of a guy and I'm curious who you guys could point to who Lamar Jackson resembles that has been successful in the NFL. I don't think there's a single player. He's not going to be able to run the football. Okay, just eliminate that from your vocabulary of why you would draft Lamar Jackson. He's not going to be able to consistently run the football because the NFL defenses are not going to allow him to do it. Michael Vick, interesting comparison. I don't think he's as accurate from the pocket as Michael Vick was. And he certainly, Michael Vick, did not get to play in a Bobby Petrino offense in college that exploited every single talent he had. But he's not as big as Vince Young, if you want to make that comparison. He's not as athletic as Vince Young. He's probably better from the pass, passing than Vince Young, but he's not as big and strong, as tough as Vince Young. So I have zero faith in Lamar Jackson. I have watched all of these guys but Josh Allen play a ton, but I've got Lamar Jackson in the five spot. Don't like him at all. In the four spot, Josh Allen. Now, look, one of my theories that I have stuck to when it comes to evaluating NFL quarterbacks is if you aren't accurate in college, you're not suddenly going to become accurate when you get to the NFL. And if you aren't accurate in college and you aren't dominating against lesser competition, accuracy is something that can't be taught. You either have the ability to place the ball in the right location or you can't. And I got burned on this by the Tennessee Titans when it came to Jake Locker. If you remember Jake Locker, when he got drafted, he had a poor completion percentage and he was a big guy, strong guy, had the ability to make a lot of throws and the Titans came out and said, we have looked at all the evidence surrounding Jake Locker and we believe we can explain why he made the throws that were not able to be caught. We think that he threw the ball away a lot, he didn't have a good offensive line, his wide receivers were not good. I think all those are excuses. And if Jake Locker could not complete passes at a high level in college then it's unlikely that he's suddenly going to go to the NFL where your window's narrow, where your players are more athletic, where the, uh, where the wide receivers are not as open, and he's going to suddenly become incredibly successful in college. Plus, and very few people talked about this, I don't think Jake Locker was that smart. I think he's of average intelligence. Nothing against him. He scored a 20 on the Wonderland. To me, what you have to do is when you break this down, you look in a larger context and you break it down and you say there is no way whatsoever that Josh Allen actually breaks down in a way that makes a lot of sense. So when you dive into it, when you dive into it and you look at Josh Allen's numbers going back throughout time, he has absolutely no ability. Okay, Josh Allen has no ability to complete a high level of passes. I don't believe that in any way he's going to suddenly become able to do it when he actually gets to the NFL level. So I have him at four. I have him at four. That's the highest I can go with Josh Allen. I have zero faith in him. He's the quintessential Browns draft pick who doesn't pop out. All right? Doesn't pan out. In the three spot, Baker Mayfield. There are very few players that in the NFL at quarterback can play on the edge consistently and be successful. Cam Newton has done it somewhat although he's met, put himself a, uh, a trigger on his back with his Superman celebrations and everything else. Occasionally, Aaron Rodgers can do it. By and large, the number of people out there who can come in and actually be phenomenal are few and far between and play with an edge. Now, I don't think Baker Mayfield is that similar to Johnny Manziel because I don't think he's anywhere near the athlete that Johnny Manziel was. I don't think Baker Mayfield is going to be able to make on the field the plays that Johnny Manziel made. And so to me, in general, Baker Mayfield slides in at the three spot. I think if you want to believe on a ceiling, if you want to believe a ceiling guy for Baker Mayfield, it is Russell Wilson. He has the ability to scramble. He has the ability to run uh, and occasionally make a play. I don't think he's as athletic as Russell Wilson and I don't think he has as big of an arm as Russell Wilson. So to me, again... I don't believe in Baker Mayfield as the number one overall pick. That leaves us with two guys. That leaves us with two guys right now. My three spot, Baker Mayfield. My four spot, Josh Allen. My five spot, Lamar Jackson. And then my top two, Sam Darnold and Josh Rosen. I think that Josh Rosen is the better of these two options because I think if you, I don't think either one of these guys were very well coached. 
Josh Rosen had to change his offense a bunch of different times. Sam Darnold never really seemed like the scheme fit his overall talent. But I think Rosen has the lowest floor and a similar ceiling to what Sam Darnold could be. I really do. I think if you watch Josh Rosen play at UCLA, really smart guy, learned multiple offenses, had no offensive line that could block for him at all. And if Josh Rosen slides in, he's the most ready to play on day one. Okay? Josh Rosen sees the field well. He gunned it down the field against UCLA. He was, or with UCLA. He was constantly trying to make plays. And Josh Rosen, to me, looked like the best quarterback on the field. He's, he, he has a typical pocket passer uh, persona. I think that his cockiness, which is uh, rubbed his college coaches the wrong way, could play well in the NFL because it, if it manifests itself not as cockiness but as supreme confidence. So I like Josh Rosen the most. Here's my nervousness with Sam Darnold. One, we haven't seen him play that many games. We haven't seen Sam Darnold play that many games. He came in as a redshirt freshman, wowed people at the end of his uh, the year, did not show a lot of growth to me in year two. And so as a result, I believe that Sam Darnold just has a little bit of uncertainty about him. On a high level, I think Sam Darnold can be uh, Andrew Luck. Uh, Jason Martin said this morning he reminds him a little bit of Philip Rivers. I can see that a little bit. I think Darnold is more athletic, which is why I think he's more Andrew Luck. On the high end for Josh Rosen, I think the ceiling is the limit. I think he has, and this is going to sound crazy, but I think he could have a little bit of Brady in him. I think he could have a little bit of Aaron Rodgers in him. I think that the ceiling for Josh Rosen is really high. I don't think it's fair to say that those guys are going to be anything like uh, those Supreme Hall of Famers. But I think if you look at Josh Rosen and the throws that he can make and his mastery of the field and his ability to try to get down the field to make big plays, I think that Josh Rosen is my number one. So my top five NFL quarterbacks are people who came in late. One, Josh Rosen. Two, Sam Darnold. Three, Baker Mayfield. Four, Josh Allen, and five, Lamar Jackson. That is my breakdown of everybody out there that is available right now in the top five of the NFL draft. Since everybody else is doing their own mock drafts, I want to give you my real ranking of the NFL quarterbacks. All right, this story. This story is, I think, not getting as many uh, as much attention as it should. Russell Westbrook is beloved by NBA Twitter guy. NBA Twitter guy who pays attention to the regular season and is a stat nerd and is a geek loves to sit around and argue about Russell Westbrook who I think has become and proven himself to be the modern day Allen Iverson. Everybody loved to watch Allen Iverson but if you watched any of them at all if you watched Allen Iverson he never really made his teams better. He never really went anywhere. He went to the finals the one year they won their first game but he's most famous for his individual achievements and the fact that he never really melded that well with any of his other teammates. In order for uh, in order for Allen Iverson to be the best, the rest of his teammates kind of had to step back and watch. Now, Russell Westbrook is a bigger, maybe faster version of Allen Iverson. But I think if you look at what has happened with Westbrook, Oladipo leaves, thrives with the Pacers. Paul George comes, takes a step back. Carmelo Anthony comes, takes a step back. Durant leaves and wins titles. Kevin Durant was smart in the way that he made decisions. Westbrook is fun to watch, but he doesn't win. He's like a stripper. You may enjoy watching the stripper on the pole, but you definitely don't want to leave the strip club with the stripper and try to turn her into your wife. Now, you can try that, but it probably ain't going to work. All right? Russell Westbrook is fun to watch, but he ain't who you want to commit to long term. And so as a result, as a result, I think this is a fascinating study of personality. Russell Westbrook re-upped with the Oklahoma City Thunder. And he decided, I'm going to stay here with the Thunder. I'm not going to go to greener pastures. And as a result, their GM, Sam Presti, he brought in uh, Paul George and he brought in Carmelo Anthony and everybody said, watch out. They are going to be phenomenal they should at least be the third best team in the West. They'll contend with the Warriors and with the, uh, the Houston Rockets. And then what happened? They have laid an egg ever since he got there. 
crazier if you watched this series at all. Ricky Rubio has been dominating Russell Westbrook at the point guard position. In fact, it's a crazy hypothesis. But if I had to tell you right now, Rubio, who is two years younger than Westbrook, who would you rather have for the next five years? Rubio or Westbrook? I think there's an argument to be made that you would rather take Rubio because he makes his team better within the context of his ability to run his team. All right? So, this is a fascinating study, I think. Durant looked around, surveyed all the options, and said, you know what? I don't think we can get to the title with Russell Westbrook. And my goal is to win championships. And so he leaves and he goes to Golden State and everybody rips him. Oh, look at Kevin Durant. Look at what he's doing. Russell Westbrook stays behind in Oklahoma City and may never win another NBA series. I mean, that's not a ridiculous proposition to make. He's going to be 30 years old. They are likely to lose to the Jazz. Since Durant left, Westbrook is 2-7 and seven in the postseason. What is a smarter move? Going somewhere else where you can be great and where you can win titles like Kevin Durant did in making the quintessential Silicon Valley move to leave behind the Midwest and like the Jodes, go west young man to California of Grapes of Wrath style and win titles there. Or is it smarter to stay back in Oklahoma City and make a lot of money but never actually reach the full potential that you potentially have? This is phenomenal, I think, lesson in general for the world as well. So many people do what Russell Westbrook did. They don't rock the boat. They stay behind. They stay in the small market. They try to be loyal. And as a result, they never reach the full fruition of their ability. Whereas Kevin Durant is probably going to win a second title this year. As LeBron continues to fade, he's going to become the greatest player out there. And when that happens, Kevin Durant is going to have the option to go anywhere else in the country he wants and he'll already have titles in his back pocket. Maybe he wants to go to the Wizards and go back home from one side of the country to the other. Maybe he wants to make his home in Golden State. Whatever he decides to do, I think two years later, you look at this decision. And if Russell Westbrook's goal is just to maximize money, then congratulations to him for his decision to maximize money because he made a lot of money. But if your goal is to make a lot of money and also win championships, I think Kevin Durant has made the incredible play here. He's made the right decision. He took the risk. The easiest thing for Kevin Durant to do would have been to stay in Oklahoma City and take all the praise from never leaving. This, to me, is evidence, not just of sports, but how two people who are highly skilled are going to make a difference. i got to tell you, too, going just after the most money you can make is typically, typically always the wrong decision. I, this is life advice in general. If you make a decision that is entirely predicated on trying to make the most money, you typically are going to end up in a worse place than if you make a decision that maximizes your ability to succeed while also earning you a lot of money. Because in the end, is it really going to make a difference when Russell Westbrook's career is over? Whether he made $275 million or $235 million. If you can't live on 235 instead of 275 or 335 instead of 375, then you got to fire everybody around you anyway. Ultimately, all you're going to have left is your work product. And I don't think Westbrook, unless he now demands a trade, which would obviously cut into the entirety of the contract and the goodwill that he built up with Oklahoma City, is ever going to be able to make any kind of run at a title. Because you look at Paul George leaving, you look at Carmelo Anthony basically done, Russell Westbrook is left holding the bag. He's Allen Iverson 2.0, a guy who nobody else could play with and could never get the most out of his ability. That's the truth. So I'm curious if you were Sam Presti, who you would hire, who you'd go get. I don't think there's any move you can make that is going to put them back into the mix. All right. I got a great picture for you here. Our boy Mitt Romney uh, is running for the Senate in Utah. 
we're talking about Rubio versus Westbrook. And this is a, uh, this is a pretty interesting uh, breakdown. Last night, Mitt Romney was courtside in the game. And I got to show you this picture of what Mitt Romney was wearing. It is utterly fantastic if you didn't see it. I don't know how many of you saw Mitt Romney rocking the jersey last night. Here is Mitt Romney wearing the Jazz jersey with his last name on it. All right, you see that? That's Mitt Romney holding up four fingers if you can't really see. Mitt Romney with a Jazz jersey on over a button-down dress shirt. If this isn't the most white guy running for president move of all time, Mitt Romney going with the corporate button-down like blue standard shirt, like the old white man shirt, and then deciding that he's going to fit in with the basketball crowd by showing, throwing the jersey over himself and holding up four fingers for Russell Westbrook when he got the fourth foul. Total, absolute power move by Romney. First of all, you go with your own jersey. That's such a dad move. If you Does anybody else see anybody do the, the name on the back of the jersey? Anything other than a dad move? Like, I don't know how many people out there... I'm anti-jerseys in general, right? Because I think it's an embarrassment uh, basically letting the athlete know that you would give prima nocta to your wife or girlfriend if you're a grown man walking around in another grown man's jersey trying to pretend that you are him with his name on your back. You're basically just telling him, hey, if you decide to have sex with my wife or girlfriend, I will stand there while you have sex and give you high fives because I think you're so awesome. That's basically, to me, what I think every time I see a grown man in a jersey. Period. All right? Now, limited exemptions for you should never, if you're a grown man, wear a jersey of anyone that is younger than you. All right? That's my general standard. If you have a jersey and the person is older than you, it's a throwback, something along those lines, I will allow it. Otherwise, what you're basically telling everybody is that you have a mosquito dick. Nobody looks good in jerseys. You might as well just tell everybody, hey, love to high-five you while you have sex with my wife. Uh, come back to my house later. That's what I think every single guy wearing a jersey says. Now, Romney going his own name on the back of the jersey is a vintage dad move because dad gets the jersey every now and then that has his own name on the back of the jersey. Then to put it on over the dress outfit, I'm filled with questions about this. Do you think that Romney went to the game dressed like that? Because I'll be honest with you. The older I get, the more time I spend turning to my wife and saying, can I wear this? And I have complete faith in my wife to tell me whether what I'm wearing makes me look completely ridiculous. And sometimes I think she's wrong, but I give complete faith to her. I say, baby, you tell me what I should be wearing, okay? You're a lot more plugged in with uh, uh, what popular clothing is like, right? Because your average dad out there, for the rest, this is true, for the rest of his life, your average dad will continue to dress like he was when he was single. I, I mean, this, this, uh, there's a lot of truth to this, and I think it's actually better than trying to stay trendy. Your average dad out there, unless his kids or his wife is buying clothes, is going to continue to dress for the rest of his life like he did the last time he was single. I swear to God, I, in my lifestyle, am perpetually convinced that 2004 fashion never going to go out of style. I, it's like T-shirts, jeans, flip-flops, I'm sticking to it. At this point, there is no way I'm going to try to be out there and be really trendy. I'm going to wear the exact same stuff that I've been wearing my whole life. If you expect to see me in some skinny-ass jeans with my cock and balls framed up against the denim so tight that I can barely speak, it ain't happening. I see all these kids wearing these short shorts, and I see all these kids wearing these tight, like, cock-hugging pants, and I just think to myself, how does your scrotum breathe? How in the world does your penis is, like, up against a glass, uh, a glass wall, just, like, shoved up against the wall sideways? Why are you trying to put your penis into such a small area where it can't breathe. Can't be healthy. I'm telling you that sperm counts on these young kids who've been wearing these tight jeans are going to be zero. And also, where is your penis? Like, I see some of these guys walking around in such tight jeans. Like, literally, your penis is not there. Maybe maybe some of these young metrosexual millennial boys, they don't even have dicks anymore. They're like, the dick is it's too patriarchal. The dick 
suggests that I would like to have sex with women and I have no interest in having sex with women anymore. I just like to have conversation with them. I like to sit and have tea and talk about how white men are awful and we need to pull down statues. My penis doesn't even react to a naked woman anymore because I, I don't use it anymore. It's just so patriarchal. I had to just take it away. Maybe that's the message that they're trying to send with these neuterized, bisexual, not really masculine jeans that everybody's wearing. I don't get it. I don't get it at all. So I'm never going to dress like that. But Mitt Romney, I am fascinated by what is going on in general with the decision being made by the wearing of the pants. All right? Why does Mitt Romney show up in the down like the, 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 the normal dress shirt of an old white Republican and then add the jersey on top of it? The standard move, if, you were, if I were dressing Mitt Romney and he said, I'm going to wear this jersey. First of all, it would have been amazing if Romney went jersey, no undershirt and set courtside. That would have been absolutely phenomenal. That's actually how the jersey is supposed to be worn, right? The jersey is supposed to be worn with no undershirt. If you wear a basketball shirt with an, a basketball jersey with an undershirt, you look ridiculous. But how awesome would it have been if Romney had gone jersey, straight skins, courtside, then everybody would have been like, you know what? Look at Romney's guns. Look at Mitt Romney there in the Romney jersey making plays in his jazz jersey that, by the way, looked so clean it had never been worn before. I think what happened was Romney went out to dinner with somebody in his family or a friend and he was already dressed to go to the game and as part of the event, they showed up and they gave him the jersey. Because otherwise, I think when you're leaving the house, you would have to wear like, maybe maybe he goes turtleneck, maybe the mock turtleneck, not the button-down dad, like I'm a power move CEO shirt that Romney wore to sit courtside. I think it was an unexpected surprise that the, the jersey had never been worn before. All right? So I think he put it on over the shirt and this is one of those things where when your kids give you something, you have an obligation to win it, to wear it. Even if it looks a little bit ridiculous. Uh, like uh, I remember uh, when we were in Gatlinburg, uh, my mom was like, you can't get your dad a tie-dye shirt. When I was a kid, you remember how tie-dye shirts were like the baddest ass shirts ever? I remember I went to Gatlinburg. This is no joke. I went to Gatlinburg one year with like the fifth grade field trip and they had all the tie-dye shirts in Gatlinburg in the Smoky Mountains and it was during uh, World... <laughs> I swear to God. It was during the Persian Gulf War and I bought a tie-dye shirt with Bart Simpson on it holding a gun and it said, Watch out, so damn insane. It was like a play on Saddam Hussein and it was Bart Simpson like holding a uh, uh, like a, uh, a, a <laughs> I swear to God I, I had this shirt. It was Bart Simpson like a tie dye like you know the, the 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 screen printer had made a Bart Simpson T shirt and he was holding a bazooka. I wish I still had this shirt because it was such a phenomenal shirt. And it was Bart Simpson holding a bazooka and it said "Watch out, so damn insane" instead of "So uh, Saddam Hussein." And I was like, this is the baddest ass shirt I've ever seen. And I was like, I'm going to get my dad one. Fifth grade, you know, you're 10 years old. You're like, there's no doubt my dad's going to love this. And my mom was like, yeah, I don't think, you're, I don't think your dad's going to wear this shirt. I was like, why not? It's tie-dye. It's awesome. It's got Bart Simpson on it. And it says Saddam Hussein is so damn insane. She's like, yeah, it's not really a grown man's shirt. And, but if I had bought it, I think my dad would have worn it. And maybe I need to get that new shirt. I was down in Destin recently and I was in the Walmart. Swear to God, uh, the, the Panama City Beach Walmart. Panama City Walmart still has an entire section of all of the uh, tie-dye shirts. All of the tie-dye shirts everywhere. Like a corner of Walmart is still filled with tie-dye shirts and you can get the same ones that you would have gotten back in like 1988. I don't know who's buying them because I haven't seen anybody walking around in these things in a long time. But I was tempted to get a spring, spring break SB18 shirt. Uh, to wear around uh, for the rest of spring break in my Rosemary Beach uh, neighborhood. I would have been the only guy rocking the SB18 tie-dye. And again, that was pretty cool. That was pretty pretty badass. All right, final, uh, final thoughts. So Romney, and by the way, I've reached out to Romney to try to get him on OutKick. Uh, would absolutely love to get Mitt Romney on the show. Uh, we have reached out. I'm going to talk to his campaign manager. Maybe we'll be able to get him on because I'd love to hear the story of how he wore the jersey. I think Mitt Romney's a good guy. Uh, likable guy. 
Um, and I'm curious to see what he's going to end up doing. He's going to win the Senate probably in 18 in Utah. Is he going to run against Trump in the run-up to 2020 or not? I, I think that's going to be a, an intriguing question. But it seems like a genuinely good guy, smart, uh, and obviously very successful capitalist. So I like Romney. I liked Romney and Obama. I thought that was the exact opposite of the 2016 race. In 2012, the Republicans nominated Romney, who I think everybody had to say was a pretty likable guy. And even if you didn't like Barack Obama, I think everybody had to admit that Barack Obama was a pretty likable guy. And then in 2016, we nominated the two most hated people to ever run for president in Hillary and Trump, which brings me, which brings me to this Trump, story, uh, this Trump and Kanye West story. Kanye West, I've got the quote here. It's not that complicated, but I wrote it down so I wouldn't forget it. Uh, Kanye West says, quote, I love Trump. Um, so I, I thought this was an amazing uh, question and, and comment. And I think this is a really interesting opening in what is going on. For a long time, Kanye West has been a rebel. What's the most rebellious thing that a rap star can say in 2018? I love Trump. And I think Kanye West has always been open to the idea of the unconventional. Uh, if you go back and study Kanye West's entire success, when Kanye was rapping about Jesus, as you well remember, he said they won't play it on, the, on, uh, on any of their stations. And so as a result, I think Kanye is, is aware of how the tides move and that there's no bravery in being the four billionth person to say, I hate Donald Trump and be in the realm of politics. And I think Kanye is intrigued and a fascinating figure because ultimately Kanye is all about empowerment. His ultimate goal is to be a capitalist. And I've been making this argument for a long time. I want you to think about it as we finish the show today. Ever since Trump started running, I have said this. People who hate rappers the most love Donald Trump the most. And people who hate uh, Donald Trump the most love rap the most. It's a fascinating angle. I have been arguing that if you look at the way Donald Trump talks... And if you look at the way he carries himself, he's on his third different wife. It's all about bling. It's all about hot-ass women. It's all about banging as many women as he can. Grabbing a girl by the pussy, like Donald Trump said on Access Hollywood, grab a girl by the pussy could literally be a number one rap song in America. You can literally see how, if it had the right beat behind it, grab a girl by the pussy sounds like it could be a number one rap lyric in America that everybody would love and be on the dance floor talking about how they're grabbing girls by the pussy. Rappers can get away with saying anything. They have more First Amendment rights than anyone. If you actually break down what they are saying, they are able to get away with the full fruition of the English language to a degree that nobody else can. What is Donald Trump doing except disrupting the entire universe of the entire music world except doing it through politics? He is being able to do and live the lifestyle that rappers claim all the time that they are living. It's funny that Jay-Z criticizes Donald Trump now because Jay-Z is Donald Trump. Donald Trump is Jay-Z and I think Kanye West sees how interesting that is that, again, I'm not criticizing one side or the other. I'm merely pointing out that people who love rap think that Donald Trump is awful, even though if you put most of Donald Trump's most famous lines into a rap song, they would love it. And if you put Donald Trump's lyrics into a rap song, the right wing that loves Donald Trump would hate him. Donald Trump is... MC Donald. He is an old school 1980s New York rapper who ended up being president. And the fact that Kanye West, I think, sees how fascinating that is, it's amazing. And it's utterly fascinating if you think about it and you divorce your mind from just believing everything that you've already been told before. That is incredibly interesting. All right. My name is Clay Travis. I appreciate all of you. Thank you for spending your Tuesday afternoon with us. We will be back on Wednesday, tomorrow morning, loaded show, 6 to 9 a.m. Jason Whitlock going to join us in hour three. In hour two, we will have a spectacular uh, uh, guest with Jeff Schwartz. We'll break down the NFL, the NBA, and the NHL. I am Clay Travis. 
Don't be a pussy. DBAP, boys and girls, this has been Outkick the Show.